Amen. Well, we, we've been talking about everything moves at the speed of relationships. Our subtopic is uh, we've been talking about how to communicate uh, with the opposite sex, how to communicate with the opposite sex, how to, how to talk to the person that you've declared your, your love for, your, 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 your teamwork for, how to communicate with that person. Now, just remember, just remember, there are a couple of things to remember uh, at the top. Uh, number one, every message is not for you. Some, you know, some of us are, uh, have aged enough where we say, well, you know, I don't, I don't care nothing about being in a relationship, okay? And, and that's good, but you have children. Your children, they're going to come to you, and, and, and other folks' children are going to come to you, and other folks' teenagers are going to come to you, and you... You, you need to be able to give them good, solid, biblical instructions that's going to help them to be successful at their marriage and their family life. And so every sermon is not just for you to take away and say, well, that was, that was wonderful for me, or, you know, uh, I'll wait to go back to church after pastor could conclude talking about that. Every word that God sends is either for you or through you. And just always remember that, okay? Amen? All right. So the second thing is, is that the things that I, I minister on are in the Christian realm, uh, uh, meaning if you draw down on the principles of some of the things that I say, you can use them in the world, but they're not meant for the world because the world don't do what we do. And, and so hence, if you, if you say, Pastor, well, uh, I'm going to date who I want to date, you know, and, and not even God can tell me who to date. It's my life, okay? And if you take that approach and that attitude to life, uh, it's going to be very, very hard to, to get someone to team up and partner with you that don't believe the way you believe. Amen. Amen. That's difficult. It is. It's difficult to uh, try to ask somebody to go the way you're going, but you, they're going in the opposite direction. And so you have to, you have to take your time and, and set up your values, your core values, to help you to be able to say no to people out front, especially if you're in a dating realm. And then take your time to uh, get to know people. I, I um, you know, used to, you know, back in our generation when we were younger, um, you know, most of us in this room uh, that's been, you know, at, at least married one time, uh, we generally got married somewhere in our, in our 20s, and, 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 uh, which was kind of the way things were in, in our day. But today, I don't even recommend anybody that's in their 20s to get married. I, I tell them, wait till they're 30. And the reason why I tell them that today is it, it, because uh, the, the, the younger people are maturing at a slower rate. They're maturing at a slower rate. Men were already uh, waking up around 28, 29 anyway. And so now they don't wake up till they're 35 now. <laughs> You, you talking about you talking about partner with somebody in their twenties today? That's difficult. And so, if I had to say to you, as a parent, as a grandparent, about your children or your grandchildren or your great grandchildren, I would say to you, be a counselor to them and 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 help them to make it through their twenties and discover what they want to be and who they want to do life with and what kind of life they want and help them get started that way, so that way they can choose a partner in life that's going the same way. Amen. Now, are they going to listen all the time? No, they're not going to listen all the time, but that don't mean you can't talk all the time. That's what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be the voice by which they hear instructions that are going to help uh, them in life. So, uh, please, I'm asking you as a Christian, and even as a, uh, I don't know if I can do this as a sinner, but as a Christian, I'm asking you, just don't go out and, and just get anybody. Now, listen, if, if at some point in your life as a, as a person, you have to evaluate who you are. And, and you have to be able to say and be honest with yourself who you are and whether or not you should even be considered to be a dateable person. Should people date me? If, you know, if you, you know, you, every time you turn a corner, you're lying. You ought not want to put that on anybody. 
You ought to just say to yourself, you know, wait a minute, oh, don't mess with me, I'm bad news. I'm a, just go around with a sign, I'm a liar. Don't bother me. <laughs> I'm not the one. I'm going to mess your life up. You fool with me. <laughs> but at some point, there has to be a self-evaluation, an examination of yourself, who you are, and to discover whether or not you're ready for a relationship. Now, that's going to help all of us to, to be happy in life. It's going to help us. It's going to help us have joy once people who are out here playing can just say, that's what you're doing. You know, I'm playing. That's what I'm doing. I'm playing in life. And, and right now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the one you want to be with. And once you, you, you people start doing that, then you can start choosing in a whole different light and you don't have to go through all these games that people play in the world today. Amen? Amen. All right. So today I want to talk about, uh, continue to talk about uh, reconciliation. We left off there last week talking about reconciliation was one of the goals for marriage communication. And then we talked to you about be, becoming life-giving, becoming a life coach to your, to your spouse or the person that you're seriously dating. Be, become life-giving. Yeah, you've got to impart into them life. Don't become that person that's pessimistic over life. Be, a, be optimistic about everything that you're doing in life and that the two of you can achieve anything that you put your hands to. And, and that's possible when you go in the same direction. Amen? All right, so let's, uh, let's do this. I won't go to the goal at the top. I'm going to go to our goal at the bottom of the lesson today. So let's do this. Uh, I want to talk about the ministry of reconciliation, that each and every one of us who are Christians, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, some people say, well, you know, I'm not a minister, so I can't do such and such, or God ain't called me into the ministry. But he, every believer, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation so that you and I will have the tools necessary that when something goes wrong, which they will, when something, some, something goes totally opposite of what you plan, which they will, that you're willing to go inside the ministry of reconciliation, which you have an anointing and a grace to watch this operate and function through, that you can put things back aright through the ministry of what? Reconciliation. I shared with you last week, you have to determine, prayerfully you determine these things when you were dating, you have to determine what you're not willing to reconcile over. That if you put your hands on me, no reconciliation. We're done. You can't reconcile that. You can't reconcile abuse. Be quiet. I got a silent amen over there, and I heard that's true. But you have to decide that. Now, if you, I mean, you want them to slap you on the refrigerator every day. I mean, hey, that's what you, you want to be involved in that. Then that's you. But, but that, that, they don't, there ain't no ministry of reconciliation over there. And so you have to agree to these things up front. Up front, yeah, I mean, like last week, my last my my, my uh, 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 um, example last week was, you know, something as small as they eat your last cookie. Now you, you may be mad for you know a couple of minutes, but you can reconcile over that. Now in between the cookie and being slapped, you have to decide what you're not gonna take. Oh. And up front, now I'm not talking about deciding and keeping it to yourself. No, the two of you sitting down and the two of you agreeing that these, this, is, this is a no-no to me. This, this goes against my values and how I, I, I'm genetically made up. And once you do that, the other person who hears that have to honor that. Don't treat them like they don't know what they're talking about. They know what they're talking about when it comes to them. And don't try to change their mind. What you have to do is honor that, respect that. If you honor and respect that, you're going to be okay. The relationship is going to be okay. Amen? All right, so you have to decide what you're not willing to reconcile over. Now, the things that we're going to deal with, things that you can be reconciled through. Amen? All right, so go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 18 through verse number 21. Uh, I think I want to do this. Uh, let's try it in, in the King James Version. It says, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to who? 
How did he do it? In other words, when Jesus died, God Father, God the Father, when the Son died in his death at Calvary, God was using the ministry of reconciliation to bring all of us back to God. Back in right standing, right relationship, new matter, new mercy, new grace, all of it came by virtue of what Jesus made available at Calvary. When you and I received Jesus Christ as personal Savior, now reconciliation is deposited on the inside of us. Now that helps you not to be mad for three weeks at a time. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just mad. What you mad for? You still mad over uh, how y'all he spilled milk on the counter last that was three weeks ago? You still mad. Now you don't want to go buy no milk because he going to spill it. <laughs> Watch this. He says, and God have given to us the what? God have given to us what? The ministry of reconciliation. The ministry. God hath given to all of us, all of us, the ministry of reconciliation. Now, now again, this is you can use this in all kind of facets because you know whether you have a disagreement on your job, God has given to you, the Christian, the ministry of what? Reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. People hurt you, you go through these bad relationships with friendship, and people hurt you, God has given you what? The ministry of what? Reconciliation. You have to say to your friends. Now look, here, let me tell you this. One of the things that I don't tolerate with friendships with people is one, two, three, and four. You have to let them know that. So they don't be, they're not guessing when you don't call them no more. They already know. They already know this is not a reconcilable relationship. But for those who will respect and honor how I'm built out and they know who I am, yes, we can reconcile. We can reconcile. But I'm not going to reconcile and let you continue to abuse the relationship and continue to dog me out and treat me like I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a man on the floor. I'm not going to do that. God didn't call us to that. But what he did call us to is when two of us agree, now we can reconcile. Why? Because there's reconciliation on the inside of us. But if you, you marry and date sinners, they don't reconcile. I know you're thinking about the Christian that don't reconcile. I know. But they have it in them. They have it in them. And pride and arrogance and, and, you know, woe is me. All of those things began to step forward and then shut that person's spirit down. Plus, you, you going through the stop signs and the yield signs, you know, you're just going to beat them in with it. And then most people won't reconcile. Most people are going to be mad when you use what they, they've held as secret and they give it to you and then you use it against them. But God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So we can be reconciled in our relationships. Say it with me. I can be reconciled in my relationships because I have the ministry of reconciliation on the inside of me. All right, let's continue on to the next part. To wit, to wit, to the extent that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto who? Himself. Not imputing, I love this. Listen to it out of your vein. Not imputing their trespasses where? Not, not repeating it over and over. You think about the last time y'all argued. Y'all argued over the thing that y'all argued over the last time. And then the thing that y'all argued over the last time. Then y'all argued again over the last thing that y'all argued over the last time. Why? Because you kept imputing the sin. You kept bringing it up. I'm going to pray right here. Y'all y'all need prayer? Y'all real stingy on them amen this morning. That's what it's talking about. It said, said, listen, God reconciled us to himself because he don't bring up our past. <laughs> How can you say that God loves you but he keep bringing up what you did three years ago? And it's, it's the, one of the things that's a shame is that we'll bring up stuff that the person did that they didn't even do with you. <laughs> ah. 
God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling. Recon reconciliation is not to impute the trespass over and over and over again. So what happens, Pastor, if I keep saying the same thing? Well, I remember when, and I remember this, and I remember. If you keep doing that, then there's no reconciliation. The gateway to reconciliation will not be available. God has taught us how to do it. He's saying if you're willing, if you're willing to lay down the fact that that happened in your relationship, and you're willing to jump over the, the bridge or the, or the gap, and say, I'm not going back that way anymore. I'm not going to bring it up anymore. Now, a part of that reconciliation can make manifest itself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And have committed unto us the what? He says, I want you to follow up behind what Christ did. I want you to follow up. Now, we're believers. We're Christians. And I want you to follow up behind what Christ has already done. And that is that he hath reconciled us to God, not imputing our sins, not making us guilty over and over and over, not condemning us over and over and over. Now think about it. Think about it. Think about how, you know, uh, uh, we raise our children. How we raise our children is important. You can't keep bringing up that they didn't take the trash out on Tuesday. Okay? It's Wednesday. They didn't take it out. Okay? So when the trash man coming again on Friday? Now, what you going to do, remind them on Friday morning they didn't take the trash out on Tuesday? No, you're going to remind them, hey, don't forget today, you got to get that trash out there to the road. Some of y'all looking like, what? That's one of my key things, Pastor, is to put my foot on Junior. <laughs> and then you keep bringing it up over and over and over, and then what happens is the child shuts down, and they don't talk to you anymore. Because they can't be open to you because you keep shutting them down based on what you keep bringing up over and over and over and over. And the more they tell you, the more ammunition they give you. The Reverend preaching good here early this morning. He says, he says, for us who are believers, we have reconciliation on the inside of us. Now, follow that up by, watch this, getting word on reconciliation down on the inside of you. Because God has given us the ministry and he's given us a word for that ministry under the spirit and the anointing and the grace of reconciliation. Everybody say reconciliation. reconciliation. All right. Y'all can read all the way down to verse number 21, okay? All right, let's go to Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Ephesians chapter 4, 29 through 32. And uh, let, let's do these, uh, do this in the message. If you, if you were not the message, but uh, the uh, amplified, do, do it in the amplified. Ephesians 4, 29. All right, so we know that the ministry of reconciliation is on the inside of us. Now we can begin to talk to each other because the goal is, the goal is always reconciliation. That's always the goal. The goal is not to put you out. The goal is not to run you away. The goal is what? Reconciliation. All right? He said, do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth. But only such speech as is good for, the, for, for building up others according to the need and the occasion. So that it will, it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. Go to the next part. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please him by whom you were sealed and marked branded as God's own. For the day of redemption, the final deliverance from the consequences of sin. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault finding, and slander be put away from you, along with every kind of malice and spitefulness, of verbal abuse, and malevolent, malevolence. Be kind and helpful to one another, tender hearted, compassionate. Understand. I love that in the bracket. Compassionate and what? Now let, notice what he's saying here. This to, to keep you in the vein of reconciliation, you gotta you gotta make sure you 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 season your words. When the other person tells you to stop talking about the whole situation, just go on stop. Don't tell them this my this my mouth. <laughs> 
<laughs> They're already saying to you that what you're saying is, is out of spite and, and hurt and, and, it's, and it's leading down a path that, that, that's going to hurt us from reconciling. Yeah, well, you know, this is a good day. You, you, know, if you ever woke up on a good day like your birthday? You know, a birthday is a good day. But the other person don't remember is your birthday. And they want to fight on your birthday. You're like, not today. Not today. Check me tonight at 12 or 1 a.m. Let's do that tonight. Well, not today. <laughs> it says forgiving one another readily and, readily and, readily and freely just as God, I love this, because God set the example of what reconciliation looked like. Just as God, when he was in Christ, also did what? That's why choosing the right person up front is important. That's why it's important up front to know who they are and who you're dealing with and whether or not you're able to forgive them. Because, I mean, if you chasing them down the boulevard every week, it's hard to forgive that. It's hard to be running behind him every, you know, some people in life got so many tricks and schemes, it just wear you out mentally, physically, psychologically, emotionally. Any other, Lee? <laughs> it just wear you down. Because if they, if they are God-centered and they're seeking the same goal you're seeking, it's too easy to forgive them because watch this. You know that reconciliation is a part of your relationship. Let's, let's go to another scripture. I got a place I'm working to. Let's go to uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. Romans 5 and 10. Romans 5 and 10. For if, if, uh, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, it is much more certain, is that another part, having been reconciled, that we will be saved from the consequences of sin by his life. That is, we will be saved because Christ lives today. Man, what a powerful statement. Let's go, let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 through 24. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Now, these are uh, statements that Jesus made. I'm going to do chapter 5, then we're going to go to chapter 18. Uh, Matthew 5 and 23. All right, all right, let's look here. He says, so if, you're, if, if, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, now, you got to remember in context, Jesus is ministering during a time where the Hebraic laws are still in, in, in motion, meaning the laws of Moses, the Old Testament, the Old co uh, Commandments, and all of the Ten Commandments. Everybody with me? So he's, when he started talking about the offering at the altar, he's talking about sacrifices that they would make ceremonially. That making sense? Okay, so he says, but if you are presenting your sacrificial offering at the altar, and while you're there, you remember that your husband, that your wife, that your boo-boo has something such as a grievance or legitimate complaint against you. Oh, Lord. Because there are a lot of us who come to church upset, angry, mad, you know, all of that. And we got, we got you know, I'm going, I'm, going, I'm going to church, got to get my spirit right. The whole while you're thinking about, okay, now when I leave here, I got something for them. <laughs> so Jesus, Jesus, who has reconciliation in his ministry and has the ministry of reconciliation, who has the grace and the anointing for it, he says to us, yeah, sacrifices are good. You sacrifice it for the right intentions, all that. All that's great, but, but something that you're missing. God is not accepting of sacrifices when, you, when you, you haven't used the ministry of reconciliation. So you think about how your prayers are hindered all because the two of you haven't reconciled. Whew. He says, a legitimate complaint. Now go to the next, next part. He says, this is what he says. This is, what he says. this is how we respond. Leave your offering at the altar and do what? And go. First make peace with your husband, wife, children. First make peace there and then come and do what?
the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation, being reconciled unto God and being reconciled unto those that you've declared your love for, especially the person that you know you're going to spend the rest of your life with. Being upset is not worth the, the, the price that you're paying for it. You got to be willing to let it go and you got to be willing to, to manage it when you feel like it's going the wrong way. You go ahead and get on top of it right there and say, oh, this is going the wrong way. So that way you ain't got to worry about it messing up your prayer life. You got to worry about it messing up your, your relationship with God. And, and what, have to worry about the guilt trip that Satan going going to try to play on you, okay? Go to chapter number 8 of Matthew. Chapter 18, I'm sorry, verse 15 through 17. Chapter 18, 15 through 17. I love this one because this is one that, that I have to kind of go into details, a little more details to explain because it can, it can really run off the rails if it's not explained, okay? So in Matthew 18, 15, it says, if your brother sins, if your brother sins, now remember in context to you, we're talking about you and your relationship, that's your brother and your sister in. Does that make sense? If your brother sins, go and do what? How? All right, now, Facebook can't get this first. You don't need to be tweeting this. And don't be calling your mom and your cousin them. Oh, Lord. The Reverend preaching good here this morning. That's y'all business. That's y'all business. The, the invasion of mama them and cousin them and Ray Ray and Pookie them is the problem. Most of the reason why y'all can't reconcile because everybody in your stuff. You don't told everybody except the person who did it to you. <laughs> he don't even know you're mad. She don't even know you're mad. But you're mad, so you're going to go call everybody. The first person you're going to call is this person. I ain't got a name who it is. You already know. But the scripture says, I'm not talking to the world. I'm talking to believers. Is that the reconciliation starts between the two of us in what? Because mm, you want to win an argument. It's worth that to you. You want to win. I'm, I'm going to win this argument. I ain't won one since 1922, but I'm winning this one. But if you ain't won that long, you're probably not going to win this one either. Mm, he says, you tell him the fault in private. If he listens and pays attention to you, you have won back your brother. Now let's go a little further. Let's say that they don't. Man, I won't talk to you. Okay, all right, go to the next part. But if he does not listen, take along with you one or two others so that every word may be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now listen. <laughs> you don't take two or three <laughs> that you don't trust. It, 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 oh, Lord. And you don't take two or three that just going to be on your side. Are, are y'all getting this? Because the, the goal is not to blow the relationship up. The goal is what? Reconciliation. The goal is to gain one another. The goal is for the two of us to get back to the place where we're working toward, watch this, the same goal in mind. That's the goal. The goal is not to drive a wedge deeper into our relationship. And you will do that if you've got people that you're talking to that haven't made your team. Remember last year, this time I was talking to you about making sure you have a good team in your relationship? You only take team people in these, these, these areas of your life. You don't take, and remember, everybody don't make the cut. Your kid folk may not even be on your team. So they, they're not going to know any of this. None of it. We're going to go to that Christmas party and we're going to be, boy, we're going to be smiling and holding hands and we're going to be pinching each other's hand while we holding hands. But 
but my sister ain't gonna know it. Oh Lord, are, are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay, all right. Now, now let's say that that you you've got some folks on your team, and they won't hear that either. They won't hear it at all. You've tried to work with them. You, you, you've had people on your team to work with them, and they still won't hear. So what's the next level? Okay, so let's go to the next thing. And if he pays no attention to them, refusing to listen and obey, tell it to the who? All right, now listen. <laughs> this is not to get a microphone <laughs> and come down here saying, when I thank and praise God for the pastor and the foot lady. <laughs> And then just go start telling all your business to the whole church. You are going to be on Facebook right now. <laughs> what it's talking about is the, the pastor, the people that, that, that are vested in trust. People that are vested in trust, not, not just going around to these small groups. Yeah, you can be in the choir, but that don't mean you trust them folks in the choir. You can be a deacon. I mean, you trust the deacon. You, you trust the one that has vested interest in keeping his mouth shut. Do y'all know Reverend Preaching, boy? <laughs> See, we, 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 uh, uh, our, problem, our problem is we, 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 we're not looking for reconciliation. We're, we're looking to make sure we win the argument. Now, if I were you, but I'm not you, but if I were you, I promise you, I'm not you. But if I were you, I'd try to start at that first one and keep it right there in private. So I had to tell none of my team. Y'all didn't hear what I said. And well, I don't have to go to the pastor thinking that he bring it up in a sermon. <laughs> That's what I would do. If I were you, I, I would do that. I would keep it in private. So we would not, Stephen and Yolanda would not have an argument that won't go beyond us. Now you hear what I'm saying? The ministry of reconciliation. This is what Jesus talked about. How, this is how you reconcile. Now what happens if they want him here to pass? You've been in counseling, been in that 10 weeks, and uh, maybe 12 weeks, and once a month, and it's been a year, and nothing happening. So what do you do? All right, let's go to the next part. Let him go, uh, go uh, let, him, let him be, go back to the last part, I'm sorry, go back to the last part, okay. It, it said, go to the church, let me read that over, verse 17. If he pays no attention to them, refusing to listen and obey, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to, even to the church, I love that word, even to the church, what should you do? Let him be as a Gentile, an unbeliever, or a tax collector. You let him be like the I-I-I-S. <laughs> Don't let him come to your house. You keep him away from there. Because <laughs> you know if, if you're trying to reconcile and they're not willing to reconcile, there's a real issue there. You need to be considering whether or not you need to be in that relationship. That's the ministry of reconciliation. The goal, even in this scripture, is to keep it private. That's where you want to be. Keep it private. Don't call nobody. Keep it private. The two of you reconciling because the two of you are on the same team and you are going to have these intense moments of fellowship. You're going to have disagreements. And when you have these disagreements or these arguments or these intense moments of fellowship, you have, listen to me very carefully, you have got to put yourself in a place where you don't wound each other. We can disagree because we are. But at the end of the day, we both got to say to ourselves, nobody going nowhere. Nobody going nowhere. Nobody going nowhere. Go on and get some coffee, tea, whatever you got to get. And I'm coming up there in just a minute. And we're going to talk. I won't talk to you. All right, well then let me go ahead and brush my teeth, get ready, call my half, I got some, whatever I to do. I'll give you more 30 more minutes right there. But I'm coming up there and we are going to talk. Now notice the adamantness, adam, adamantness of, is that a word? It ain't, book 100, page 32. All right. <laughs> Notice how adamant you have to be in terms of, watch this, staying together. You have to be adamant about that. You have to, you have to go all in. 
in that. Otherwise, Satan will drive a wedge between you and the person you de you've declared your love for. And you, the two of you aren't more successful than what you think. Y'all good together. Y'all not only look good together, but y'all really good together. You know how some couple look good together? You, you know, you see them stock photos and they look good together. You and your boo, y'all look just as good. You just don't realize it. You think, you think that you, you think that y'all ought to be the stock when y'all are the original. Y'all original stuff. Y'all are the original two of you. You're gonna be like nobody else. Okay, so how do you maintain good communication? Because I'm coming to the close of these series of messages. So how do you maintain good communication? All right? Well, in Genesis chapter 2, and we'll go there in just a second, but I do want to read two things to you. In order to maintain good communication, you have to be naked and not ashamed. Write them two, 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 two things down. You have to be naked and not ashamed. You have to be in order to maintain communication. Now, that's going to cause for some level of vulnerability. That's why, again, I go back to this start. If you and, and Frankie Joe and Shanene are not compatible, then you shouldn't get in it. Because if not, if not, it's not going to last. Because you're going to have to be naked with that person and you're going to have to be unashamed to be with that person. Amen, Rem. Trust creates the intimacy required in an open and unashamed relationship. Say it again. Trust creates the intimacy required in an open and unashamed relationship. It pulls the two teammates together. Now, if you don't trust them, being naked and unashamed, you will not be. You don't trust them. You don't trust them. And, and the truth is, there are some of us in the room who can't be trusted like that. That's true. That's true. I don't expect no amen right there. I know you're sitting with him. Don't, don't say amen. Just, you know, <laughs> be right. yeah, I understand. I don't expect nothing right there. But it's one thing that you came in the room today not uh, being a person that's of trust, and it's another thing to go out of this room and maintain that same character. At some point, when if I spend my days with you, if I spend my days with you, so far I, I've spent uh, 29 years, that's counting our dating years with Yolanda, and uh, if I can't trust her by now, you see, I, I just had my 51st birthday. Let's see. Let's say I live to be, uh, let's just say 80 for math. So that's uh, how many years that is? 29 more years? Good God, girl, I spent my whole life with you then, didn't it? How many years that be? 58, wouldn't it? 58 years. Woo! You can't trust her? I guess I should ask, can you be trusted in your relationship? Now, I'm not talking about trusted to go to the grocery store and then come back home. No, no I'm talking about the conversations, the communication. Can, can you be trusted that when I, when, I, when I come in the house and, and I'm, I'm emotional about whatever happened on my job or whatever happened at the store, that, that Yolanda is, is, is not going to look at me and say, you better suck it up. <laughs> Little weak joker, you better suck it up. <laughs> By now, she ought to know when tears are going to come. And be, be prepared to be a coach in that weak moment. Boy, oh, I dropped something on you that time. At some point, you've got to be, be trusted. You've got to be trusted. You're going to, you're going to have to be trusted to make home number one and make that top priority and make your family top priority. You're going to have to be trusted in that. 
And if you're not trusted in it, it's going to shine through. You got to be trusted where finances are concerned. You got to be trusted. A check going to come in this house once a month, once a week, or twice in a month. Ooh, we got quiet right there. But you, you've got to be trusted in that. At some, at some point in your life, you, somebody on this planet got to be able to trust you. And that should be a goal of yours. One of your goals in life is, be, is to be a trustworthy person. I want you to listen to this statement I wrote down. It says, uh, after God brought Adam and Eve together, the first man and woman, we found a beautiful expression of pure intimacy. They were both naked and they felt no shame. In other words, they had nothing to hide physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. They had nothing to hide physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. They were not embarrassed or ashamed in each other's presence. That's why God created them. Adam and Eve were not ashamed, were not afraid of their vulnerability to each other in all the realms, emotionally, physically, psychologically. You know, you know when, when, when sometimes, I, I'll say it to my wife, sometimes just deep down in me, I, I have this, this longing to go home uh, to Sulacaga sometimes. Sometimes, because in my DNA, I'm just a country boy, in my DNA, and, and sometimes I have this longing to go home and, and, and uh, just go to my mom's gravesite and, and, and share with her where I am. And usually every year, that'll happen to me. But in, in, in that moment, I get kind of teared eyed and kind of stuffed up because I realize that all that God has done in my life, just my peace, my peace of life, in, in the back of my mind, in the front of my heart, I wish my mama had been here. Does that make sense to you? But watch this. I need somebody to say that to. I need to be able to turn and look at my wife and say, hey, you know, shoot, man, all these years I, I wish my mama had been here instead of just holding that in and then going back out in the back and, and talking to the birds out back. Because God created us to be there for one another. But can you be trusted like that? Can you be trusted like that? Or would you use it against them? The next time y'all had an intense moment of fellowship, that's why you're weak, see? That's why you're weak. When I had talking about your mama. Your mama been gone a long time. Yeah, it cut deep. It cut deep. Cut on down in your heart. And you just think that you went in an argument. But what you're doing is you're making me put my clothes on. Go on, Rem, go on, Rem, go on, Rem. What you're making me do is cover up. You're making me now start to have to hide that emotion. You're making me now have to, have to walk on eggshells because I don't know what I can say to you that you now, watch this, can hold as precious and dear and secret. Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter number two. Uh, I've got to get done here. My time running out here. In Genesis uh, chapter number two and uh, verse number 25. And then I'm going to go back to uh, verse number uh, 18. It says, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed or embarrassed. Adam and Eve. They, they were both naked physically, yeah. Uh, I was talking to my wife. I see this show sometimes on uh, on a television called Naked and, and, and Not Afraid, I think is what it's called. And uh, uh, I've, I've never watched it before. I just saw it and said, hey, that's interesting. About two people naked out in the woods. I had no idea. So I asked my wife about it this morning. She was telling me that it's, it's got biblical principles in it, like this story of Adam and Eve, that the two of them, sometimes they're strangers, the two of them have to learn to work together in order to survive. They, they have to work together to provide heat. And she says, you know, sometimes a couple, they win the prize, and then sometimes you get one of them that just won't work with the other person, they quit. They come out the woods, and oh, I'm not going to the woods with them. And that's kind of how some of us have decided. 
I'll go to the woods with anybody else except John Henry. Well, John Henry ain't going to play fast. I ain't going there with him. See? And that's what, that's what happens when, when we decide that we confess our love for somebody, but then we start putting our clothes on because we, we now are ashamed to be with them and, and we're, we're embarrassed by the whole fact that everybody know our business. Everybody know our business. All out on Facebook. I mean, you, the person right there in the next room, and you trying to say it to them, 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 them post a, 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 something on Facebook so they can get it off Facebook. Why would you do that? Then your cousin, I'm chiming in. Who you talking to, girl? <laughs> Another cousin chime in. That must be John Henry. She talking about. They back at it again. Why would you say that to the world? And you don't realize all it does is causes the other person to put the clothes on. There you are, tell my girl, take that, take that off, take that off. She said, no, I can't take that off. I don't know what you're going to say. I don't know what's going to come out of your mouth. I don't know if you're going to care and you have compassion for me. Now, I want to go back and uh, show you uh, in verse number 18. I'll read 18 through 25 because it all kind of connects and comes together. Go back to 18. It says, now the Lord God said, it is not good or beneficial. For the man or the woman, he's talking to both here, but for the man to be what? Alone. That's why he gave us to one another, that it wasn't good for the man to be by himself. Who are you going to talk to? Who are you going to be unashamed around? Who are you going to be able to have those deep conversations with that are beneficial to both of their lives? So it was not good that a man be alone. He said, I will make him a what? One, listen to what, how, the, how the Amplified defines the helper. One who does what? That's what you need. You don't need no cutie nor no shouty. Y'all didn't get that, did you? You don't need no cutie nor no shouty. What you need is some what? Balance. You need someone that's going to do what? Bring balance in your life. Go to the next part a counterpart who is suitable and complementary for him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every animal in the field, every bird in the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever he, the man called the living creature, a living creature, that was his name. And the man gave names to all the li uh, livestock and all the birds of the air and every animal in the field. But for Adam, that was not found a helper that was suitable, a companion for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed the flesh that, uh, uh, at that place. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made fashion and formed it into woman. And he brought her unto, and presented her to the man. Then Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be what? Joy to his wife, and the two of them shall be what? All right, now notice the last scripture in here, notice what, verse 25, and then, once they decide to leave and cleave, once they decide that the two of them were team, once they decided that the two of them were going to do life together and that the two of them were going to be mature in the relationship, then we find, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed nor embarrassed. Now, preacher, what does this lead us to? It leads us back to our goal. It leads us back to our goal. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5 and 6. It leads us back to our goal. It leads us back to the place where we started this series of messages. That if, we, if we're going to be naked and unashamed, if we're vulnerable enough to be able to say that I, I'm, I'm praying that I'll be able to share my heart with you and it won't be crushed. Now watch what it says. Now, now that you know that, now that you know that reconciliation is a ministry that God has given to us so that we can come together, now what should you do, preacher? Conduct yourselves. With what? Wisdom. In your interactions with others, especially non-believers, and make the most, every time you sit down and talk to your spouse, every time y'all riding down the road, every time y'all leaning with it, rocking with it, holding hands in the car, every time y'all walking in the park, every time y'all do whatever y'all do, make the most of each opportunity and you treat it as something 
precious. You treat it as something precious. You treat it as something precious. And how you do that, how you follow it up, let your speech at all times be what? Gracious and who? And pleasant. Let your speech at all times be gracious and pleasant. At all times. At all times. Especially at home. Let it be gracious and pleasant. And then watch this. Season it with the right salt. Season every conversation with the right salt. Sometimes when I'm talking to my wife, I have to say to myself, okay, let me see how I can say this. And then she'll say, go on, say it, but she don't mean that. <laughs> how do you know? Experience is a great teacher. <laughs> go on, say it, get it out. No. Uh-uh, uh-uh, I need to think about this before I say this. And then sometimes I just tell them, never mind, don't worry about it, don't worry. And then you know when you say that, then, no, nah, uh-uh, uh-uh. But I have to learn to reach and get the right salt. That, that's not going to work because I know that this, this seasoning, I've tried it on other conversations. It didn't work. So I, I've got to get the right seasoning. The right seasoning is important. He says, why? Why would I slow down the seasoning in my conversation? So that you will know how to answer your spouse, your boo, anytime they have a question. My wife asks questions all the time. She asks questions all the time. Sometimes I get tired of asking all them questions. <laughs> you tell, I, tell, she was, I was, I was, as she asked me this past week, she said, where'd you, where'd you get that little, that little cake from in there? And I told her where I got it from. Then she started asking questions. Well, did you go or did somebody else go? <laughs> I went to get the cake. You went, you went to get some cake. I mean, she, if you, when you talk to my wife, when you talk, when I, well, let me put it this way. When I talk to my wife, I already know going in, questions are going to be asked. <laughs> On the simplest of things, questions are going to be asked. <laughs> that's all of them. All right, Pastor David says, that's all of them. All the ladies like, what? All right, don't put y'all in the sermon. Don't get, get out the sermon, get out the sermon. <laughs> oh. You will know how to answer every time they have a question. You know how to answer every, But now listen, this, this is where trust come in. You can't tell them one thing. Today, that's your answer. Then tomorrow, you got to another answer. Hello, somebody. That's where the trust comes in. That's where, that, that's where you're open and you're vulnerable. You're able to say, yeah, I went, went down into whatever place. I can't tell y'all because it, it, it's, it's just too good. It would be sin for me to tell you. <laughs> okay, I went to Gisettes. Gisettes is sin. That's they ought to close that play down over there. That's, that's a sin, man. That's sin over there now. Ooh, Lord. And you know, and then she tells me, I said, "You ever been over there before?" She said, over there. I know where it is, just like you do. <laughs> Oh, Lord. So it, that they may have, because they're going to have questions, and that you watch this, you don't have to be defensive. If you operate in honesty, and you operate in integrity, you don't, you don't go over there, what you questioning me for? What you questioning? This is the question. Because everybody's going to have questions. They'll have questions on your job. They want to know, why are you showing up late? Don't me, you, you don't know what I had to go through this morning. Well, go on back over there where you were then. We around here, we ask some questions about why you're late. <laughs> That's going to determine whether it's an excuse or tardiness or not excused. See? So the goal is to make sure that we're gracious, pleasant, and how do we do that? We season every conversation with what? Salt. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. Y'all receive it today? Yeah. Well, let's give our great God a big thank you. Come on, let's stand to our feet, if you will. Our prayer team is at the altar. We're coming to the end of this series of messages. The last Sunday in the month, I've asked my wife to come up and teach with me at the end of the year. 
Our goal is to help, to challenge. I know it's a challenge. It's a challenge when you've been saved and you've done life together in a certain way and you just kind of come to live with things. But at some point, you've got to be able to say, we've got to become Christ-centered in whatever we do. That's where the results come from. And so, I pray that you go out of these doors, number one, if you remember some of the things we talked about in the series of messages, number one, start to view the opposite sex from a New Testament perspective. Then number two, start to communicate from the New Testament believer's perspective. When we do that, things are going to be well. You're not going to lose. You're going to win in your relationships. And then number three, make sure that you're dating people who have marriage as their goal. If you don't, then you, you're headed for a whole lot of turmoil. And make sure those folks are Christ-centered. Yeah, the two of you can grow together and the two of you can focus together. I agree to that. That's important. But make sure that you've got the right values. That person tell you, I don't believe in God, I'm an atheist. You, you, you don't need to struggle with that. You don't need to struggle with that. So focus. Focus on the relationship. Get in right relationship and they'll flourish. They'll blossom, they'll bloom. I'm going to pray and give the benediction if you want to come to the altar. These men and women of God will be here at the altar and you can come. So, Father, we thank you for our time together today. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for what we've learned. We thank you for our life experiences, the total package. And we thank you, Father, for all that we've experienced together in our relationships. And so, Father, we pray that as we go forward, Father, we can use these things as testimonies of your goodness and your reconciliation and you using the ministry of reconciliation on the inside of us. And so, Father, now bless your people. Bless them that they go out and reconcile. All of those that have been harboring resentment, hurt feelings, and distractions that come along, I pray, Father, they'll be released from that today. They'll get back on right path in their relationship and go and win in this relationship. So thank you for doing this. Thank you for helping us. You are help. You are help, you are our keeper, you are our sustainer. So bless your people as they go today. Give them grace and peace. May the angels that are heirs of salvation be released to go before the people of God and provide heavenly protection. Your good hand and graciousness be upon them all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, come on, let's give our great God a big thank you. God bless you all. Y'all have a great rest of your week.